Himalayas. Highest peaks on Earth. Hidden in their cold and forbidding embrace, ancient myths and modern legends. Lost horizons, Shangri-La. Around their flanks lies an enchanted land where hot and humid subtropical areas sweat beneath the bone-chilling cold of high mountain ranges, where parched deserts burn beneath frozen rivers of ice. It's a diverse land of warm, hospitable people with a humility cultured by centuries of living amid giants. One can see this land as a tourist, but to experience it, one must become an explorer on the cutting edge of adventure. Above the Indian subcontinent is the world's tallest mountain range. The Himalayas stretch almost 1,500 miles in a great arc passing through the state of Kashmir in India and the country of Nepal. We'll begin our Himalayan exploration at Srinagar, the intriguing capital of the Indian state of Kashmir. In the rugged Ladakh region of Kashmir, we'll visit Leh, the ancient Buddhist trading town on the caravan route to Tibet, and the remote hidden valley of Zanskar, whose mountainous isolation ended only recently. Then to the mountain kingdom of Nepal, where we'll see enchanting Kathmandu, a vibrant capital of ancient temples and colorful festivals. Trek the magnificent Annapurna Mountains, home to many of the world-famous Gurkha soldiers. Experience a wild rafting ride down the Trisuli River. Board an elephant to explore the Chitwan National Park, a wildlife refuge for the great Indian one-horned rhino. And in the eastern corner, trek to towering Mount Everest, the world's tallest peak, and visit the engaging Sherpa people. About 60 million years ago, the Indian subcontinent collided with the Asian landmass and pushed up the tallest and youngest mountains in the world, the Himalayas. Long hidden from view by physical barriers and protected by reclusive governments, a shroud of mystery hung over the snow-capped giants. Hindus believed their gods and goddesses lived in the snowy land. Intrepid travelers brought back fantastic tales of mystics and monks and hidden valleys. James Hilton molded those stories into the fable Lost Horizon. The widely read tales about the Himalayas have not only intrigued the world, but fascinated millions of Americans who wondered about the exact location of Shangri-La. Perhaps Shangri-La hides in a secluded valley. No one has found it yet. But the true story of the mountains is as fascinating as the myth and stories of the Himalayas. This mighty mantle of peaks cuts between the lush plains of India, the fertile valleys of Nepal, and the dry roof of the world, Tibet. In the west, massive K2 soars 28,250 feet, while across the 1,500-mile arc of the Himalayas, over 14 peaks top 26,000 feet. And crowning all others is Mount Everest at 29,028 feet. In height, these mountains are unequaled. Over millions of years, rivers have carved some of the deepest gorges and valleys in the world. The climate ranges from steamy subtropical to wintry Arctic alpine. The natural history is fascinating, but it is the people who live here that command our attention. Invaders, from the great Alexander's Greeks to Muslim armies, 
have crossed the Himalayas to conquer the rich and fertile Indian plains. Out of this crucible were forged two great world religions, Hinduism and Buddhism, as well as other religions. The people of these lands speak over 40 different languages and countless dialects. They worship hundreds of gods. Their traditions are passed from mother to daughter, father to son. At the heart of these diverse cultures is the vibrant expression of individual faith anchored in centuries-old traditions. <laughs> Nepal is squeezed between the vastness of China on the north and India on the south. Long and thin, it is about 500 miles in length, and at its widest, 140 miles. Nepal is a land of astounding visual contrast. Only 10% of Nepal can be cultivated, yet it must support the 18 million people, half under age 21, who live here. In this land, deities mingle with mortals. In a geographic area the size of Michigan or Austria, two-thirds of the Himalayan mountains rear their snow-capped summits, and eight of the world's ten tallest peaks form the roof of the world. Over thousands of years, people from north, south, east and west spread into the land, creating a rich culture. The Lord Buddha was born on the southern plains of Nepal, and today his followers live peacefully in the only Hindu kingdom in the world. We'll journey through a country which, until the 50s, was hidden from the eyes of the West. And now the veil of mystery is being dropped. Geographically, exploring Nepal is like climbing a ladder. At the lowest level are the hot plains and jungles along the Indian border. Then one encounters the middle hills with their temperate climate. And then, at the highest level, the Great Peaks. James Hilton portrayed an intriguing and hidden land in Lost Horizons. No map or location was given for that mythical paradise, but some believe it was Nepal. Now Nepal has opened its doors to the outside world, and visitors are free to explore its treasures. We'll discover the mysterious city of Kathmandu, the gateway to Nepal, home to over 300,000 people. Although the Western influence is growing, the Kathmandu Valley remains culturally one of the richest areas in the world. Exploring its city streets is like walking through a living museum. The ancient temples and buildings of the Kathmandu Valley only hint at the richness of history in Nepal. In 1769, King Prithvi Narayan Shah, from the western kingdom of Gorkha, overran the bickering kingdoms in the Kathmandu Valley and established a hereditary kingship. His descendants would eventually rule over what would become modern Nepal. These Italianate palaces represent the one break in that line of succession, for they were built by the Rana family, which usurped the throne for a hundred-year period. With the help of India, the kingship was restored in 1951. In 1972, King Birendra, who has traveled widely and studied at Harvard, succeeded to the throne. He rules over a country that is struggling with the concept of democratic reform in a hereditary kingdom.
This ancient and mysterious land, which was open to outsiders only in the 50s, has not been static politically or culturally. In its vibrant culture, religion pulses in the daily cadence of life, but the winds of change are blowing. The pagoda is believed to be a legacy of the Newar artisans who designed and created these works. The valley of Kathmandu is alive with pagodas. All the art of the valley has a religious motif to it, either Buddhist or Hindu. Carved on the wooden roof struts are intricate figures from the mythology of the valley. The artisans that created these works died long ago, but their skills are still with us today. Unfortunately, with each passing year, fewer artisans create new work. Today's skills are more at home in the Western world. An explosion of education and development is rocking the foundations of society, and many old patterns are dying. Cars, buses, and motorcycles crowd the streets of Kathmandu. Yet, as recently as the early 50s, vehicles were carried into the valley on porters' backs. Now, paved roads connect Kathmandu to India and China. Kathmandu is the commercial, religious, political center of Nepal. It's also the focus of the tourist industry. And each year, from all over the world, increasing numbers of travelers explore Nepal. Many will stay in comfortable luxury hotels with air-conditioned rooms, English-speaking staff, and Western-style menus. And, as in other parts of the world, bargains can be found when exploring this mystical area. Outside of these islands of the West is the medieval world of the hidden lanes of Kathmandu. Kathmandu grew as an important trading center because of its crossroads position on important trails across the Himalayas. Most businesses are small, sometimes just a woman making and selling garlands of flowers on the sidewalk. Western-style supermarkets have not arrived, so shoppers must go from small shop to small shop to find basic needs. Life's daily routines are not confined to a person's home in Nepal and neither is the pulling of teeth, the cooking of food, or the cutting of hair. The street is home to all. In Nepal, to understand the people, one must understand the importance of religion in their daily lives. Their rich pantheon of gods is real, and a story is told that the gods only stopped walking the streets of Kathmandu when electricity was introduced in the 60s. The puja is a distinctly Asian form of worship. In the early morning, the women wait in front of their favorite temple with their puja plates, piled high with sweets, fruits, flowers, and delicacies that they will offer to the deities that are important to them. They might visit a shrine such as Budanilkanta. This is one solid piece of stone that 1300 years ago was dragged across the valley floor and carved into the likeness of Vishnu. Hinduism is not a monotheistic religion such as Christianity, Islam or Judaism. It is more a way of life with many different sects. In Nepal, those of Shiva and Vishnu dominate. Western-style congregations, ministers, and worship services do not exist. Worship is a very individual act, with each person expressing his own choice in deities and rituals. A frequent type of religious activity is for a woman to light butter lamps at any of the estimated 2,000 religious sites that dot the valley floor. On special occasions, a priest might conduct an elaborate service dictated by ritual and custom. 
For the Hindu people of the valley, and for many outside Nepal, the single most important temple is the golden roof temple of Pashupatinath, dedicated to Shiva. Shiva is worshipped as both creator and destroyer, and this shrine is one of the most important pilgrimage sites in Asia. Water is one of the sacred elements to the Hindu people. The waters of the Bagmati River, which flows in front of the temple complex, are especially sacred because they flow past Pashupatinath. The women are bathing not for physical cleanliness, but for spiritual purification before entering the sacred confines of their temple. Although Pashupatinath is a main focus of Hindu activity, shrines are everywhere. And so it seems are the red marks on foreheads, called a tika. It represents the presence of the divine and the fact that a person has worshipped that day. Two great world religions shape the beliefs of this land, Hinduism and Buddhism. The stupa is a distinctly Buddhist style of architecture. A hemispherical dome is capped with a tall pinnacle with the eyes of Buddha painted on the outside. An umbrella-shaped apparatus on the uppermost point represents nirvana. It is a highly symbolic structure, believed to contain a relic of a saint or even a part of the Buddha, often festooned with prayer flags. Around Bodhanath, a strong Tibetan refugee camp has grown, and this stupa is one of the most revered sites for Tibetans. At Bodhanath, the largest stupa in Nepal, a ceremony at the death of the Chini Lama reveals the rich pageantry of this religion. The Chini Lama was one of the highest of Buddhist leaders in Nepal, and at his death, the monks from the surrounding monasteries accompany his body on its last earthly journey before cremation. Of the many stupas that dot the valley, Swayambunat, called by the tourists the Monkey Temple, is one of the most commanding. This hill has been revered as a religious site for over 2,500 years, long before Buddhism began. Some 300 flagstone steps lead up to the base of the stupa, where the benevolent eyes of Buddha look down not only upon Buddhists, but also upon Hindus. Religious tolerance is one of the central features of life in Nepal. Buddhism and Hinduism not only coexist, but commingle in a unique culture found nowhere else. At the back of this Buddhist stupa is located a temple worshipped by both Buddhist and Hindus. Not only do they share the same temple grounds, but they share the same festivals. Over 50 festivals crowd the calendar in this land of celebrations. The festival of Indra Jatra, honoring the Lord of Heaven and the God of Rain, is spectacular. On the first day, a 60-foot high pole is raised in honor of Indra. According to their legends, long ago the god Indra wandered through the valley. He was captured and only released when his mother promised two blessings. One was rain, the other that all who had died in the previous year would go to heaven. During the eight-day celebration, the streets are filled with thousands of hill people who are entertained by the masked dancers such as Lake, the devil dancer. A crowd-pleasing favorite is Ganesh, the elephant god. Believed to be the Mount of Indra when his master was imprisoned, Ganesh wandered through the streets of Kathmandu, and he still does during Indra Jatra. Central to the festival of Indra Jatra is the arrival of the Kumari, the living goddess. Selected between the age of four and five, her body must be flawless and she must show no fear when confronted with terrifying demons. If her horoscope is in harmony with the king, she will live in a special house until she reaches womanhood. She may only leave for religious festivals, and then her feet must never touch the ground. Traditionally, marrying the Kumari was believed to bring bad luck to the husband, but several recent Kumaris have successfully married. During Indra Jatra, her chariot is pulled through the streets. Both king and commoner pay homage to a little Buddhist girl who represents a Hindu goddess. 
The festive nature of Indrajatra continues at night when beer flows from the mouth of the god Sato Bhairav. Drinking the beer brings good luck. To close the evening, Lake dances by candlelight. From flagpole to Kumari to Lake, only a few elements of this complex festival, Indrajatra. The fertile Kathmandu Valley is intensely cultivated as the planting and harvesting follows ancient rhythms. Threshing the wheat is a family affair. Son and daughter pound the wheat stalks separating the grain. A more modern approach is to use passing trucks to separate the grain. Several of the cities of the valley were once independent city-states, kingdoms such as Bhaktapur, which is called the city of devotees. Nyatapola, the tallest temple in Nepal, is part of its medieval charm. At the pottery market at Bhaktapur, thousands of ceremonial items dry in the sun, while potters practice their traditional craft. While the husband works, the wife is preparing the family meal, using a few utensils, a couple pots, and a mortar for grinding spice. Dalbhat, the national dish of rice and lentils, is accompanied by vegetables and infrequently by meat. Chicken is more expensive in Nepal than in New York. With the arrival of electricity in the 60s, the use of electric cookers is increasing in Nepal. In Patan, the number of artisans casting bronze had been diminishing, but with increasing sales to tourists, the practice is doing well. After the wax is shaped in traditional designs, a clay mold is placed around the wax. Hot bronze melts the wax and fills the form. More work, filing and polishing finishes the beautiful sculptures. The most spectacular collection of Newar architecture surrounds Durbar Square of Patan, the city with a thousand golden roofs. Dozens of temples surround the square, which is the heart of the city called Lalitpur, the beautiful place. Of the many chariot festivals of the valley, the Red Machandra of Patan is the largest and most famous. Believed to bring the vital monsoon rains each year, Hundreds of devotees pull this god's massive chariot on its annual visit to the various neighborhoods of the city. Over 60 feet tall, with wheels six feet high, several hundred chanting people propel the ungainly vehicle. Kathmandu Valley is a very exciting and enchanting part of Nepal, but it is only a very small part of the country. For the Western explorer, trekking the trails of Nepal is the ultimate walking experience. Used for centuries for travel and trade, the trails are now avenues to adventure. The country is largely roadless, 
So trekking is the best way to uncover this country's charm and character. Depending upon the trek chosen, whether it lasts for days or for weeks, the sensitive trekker will encounter a constantly changing landscape with tremendous opportunities for cross-cultural engagements with their very gracious hosts. Most treks begin in Kathmandu with a bus trip to the jump-off point. Where the walking begins, porters eagerly sort out loads. These porters are paid between two and four dollars a day to carry 70 to 100 pounds on a trump line across their forehead. Without these barefooted porters, the trekking industry would collapse. People of all ages and physical ability explore Nepal on foot. Although being in good physical condition is not a necessity, it's a great help. And it is said, if you aren't in shape at the beginning of the trek, you will be at the end. To view the richness of the mountain beauty and to escape the weather's intensity, the best trekking is done in the spring and fall. On a commercial trip, highly trained staff handle every detail, from putting up tents to cooking. In the morning, trekkers average about four hours of walking. If the sun is shining or if the rain is falling, carrying an umbrella will deflect midday heat or monsoon rain. Generally, trekkers average eight to 10 miles a day unless the terrain is very difficult. A hot luncheon at a scenic spot breaks up the day before hiking to the evening campsite. If it rains, it doesn't matter. The staff brings a three course meal to the tent door. This can be the most luxurious camping in the world. And all of this is done with a smile, as pleasant as it is broad. In the center of the country, the impressive Annapurna Mountains contain no less than 11 23,000 foot peaks. Pokhara, with its beautiful reflective Fewa Lake, is a traditional beginning point for Annapurna treks. However, the classic around Annapurna trek often begins in the small town of Dumre, halfway between Kathmandu and Pokhara. This ambitious and rugged 150-mile route around the Annapurna mountains takes three weeks to a month. Passing up the Marsiangdi Valley, which bends around the back of the Annapurna Range, the traveler ascends into an increasingly remote area. Suspension bridges and steep trails lead to Manang and other Tibetan Buddhist communities with their prayer walls and prayer flags. Crossing 17,769 foot Thorong La Pass, the traveler is dwarfed by unparalleled views of the north side of the Annapurnas. Crossing from east to west, the hikers must begin early in the morning because campsites are scarce on the steep western side of the pass. While some trekking groups are turned back by storms or difficult snow conditions, the reward on a perfect day is a view of a stunning mountain world. Once over the pass, the trail drops down to the Kali Gandaki Valley and the shrine at Muktinath, which is an important pilgrimage site for both Hindus and Buddhists. Inside the temple, a burning natural gas jet has been accorded mystical qualities.
Hindus believe that washing in the 108 water spouts brings salvation after death. The Kali Gandaki Valley, lying between the Annapurna and Daulagiri ranges, is one of the deepest gorges in the world. The prosperous Takali people are Tibetan in background, although Hindu influence is growing in the area. Traditionally, they dominated trade through this area. Another popular trek in the Annapurna region is the hike into the Annapurna Sanctuary. Maurice Herzog, the famed French climber, traveled here when he wrote his classic mountaineering book, Annapurna, describing the first ascent of an 8,000 meter peak. This area, surrounded by the great Annapurna peaks, some topping 26,000 feet, is possessed with a mystical aura. One of the intriguing aspects of exploring the trails of Nepal is meeting local people. Their lives are centered around the family agricultural plots, which they cultivate by hand. Every member of the family works, and one of the tasks of young people is providing fuel for cooking. Each year, they must travel farther afield to collect wood fuel, because the hillsides and forests are being cleared for farmland. Without forest areas for grazing the animals, the trees that remain are stripped of their leaves. The bundles of leaves are carried home to feed the animals. Trekkers call them walking bushes. Life is not easy, and the many years of hard work show up in calloused hands and feet. Cleansing the house with a mixture of cow dung and water purifies the house spiritually. One of many small ways religion is incorporated into the daily lives of the people. While their culture is very different from Western cultures, common threads abound. and at the end of a long busy day, a relaxing chat with tea on the porch. From these isolated hill villages come the famed Gurkhas of Nepal. These brave soldiers bolster the forces of the British and Indian armies. Renowned for their tenacity and loyalty, they played key roles in World Wars I and II. In the 1982 Falklands crisis, South American troops fled before the reputation of the Gurkhas. In the heat of battle, Gurkhas fight hand to hand with their curved fighting knife, the Kukri. Impressed by their bravery in the Anglo-Nepali War of 1814, the British have been recruiting Nepali teenagers for over a hundred years. And after spending their working career in army bases in Hong Kong, Singapore, Brunei, or Belize, the Gurkhas return to their home villages where they are afforded great status. Joining the military is still an honored and desired goal of many young people. But today, increasing numbers of rural children are attending school. Education was once strictly for the rich and the elite, but in an effort to develop the country, the government is building schools rapidly. 
A per capita income of around $200 makes Nepal one of the poorest countries in the world materially. And simple improvements, such as clean water, bring tremendous improvements in rural living. The charm of the people and the beauty of the land attracts explorers from all around the world. The allure of hiking Nepal's mountains is no secret. Now, running its rivers, both calm and wild, is becoming more and more popular as well. Floating down a milky, silt-laden stream filled with glacial flour sends the rafters slicing through sheer cliffed gorges. Dropping down these very steep mountains, the rivers of Nepal are some of the most difficult in the world. River rafting developed during the 70s when intrepid explorers mastered the Trisoli and other rivers. Today, touring companies spread the excitement. On self-catered trips, the riders put up the tents, cook the food, and paddle the rafts for first-hand excitement when slamming down rapids. The rivers of Nepal, for the most part, end up in the Terai, a low, flat, hot land that was once covered with impenetrable jungles. Today, sections of the Terai are protected, like the Royal Chitwan National Park, 75 miles southwest of Kathmandu. For many years, this important sanctuary for endangered wildlife was the private hunting preserve of the King of Nepal. Royalty and dignitaries from around the world joined the king to shoot game from the backs of elephants. Today, you can still hunt. Not with a gun, however, but with a camera. Riding above the 15-foot-high elephant grass, the back of a padding pachyderm is a safe way to view Nepal's richest wildlife area. The elephants can approach the wild animals much more closely than a person on foot can. Once found throughout the Indian subcontinent, less than a thousand of the great one-horned rhinos survive. About 300 live in the swampy grasslands of Chitwan. Another endangered species is the rarely seen Bengal tiger. The biggest danger to animals today is not hunting, but the disappearing habitat. Fortunately, Nepal's conservation-minded government has set aside over 5% of the country as parks and wildlife refuges. The competition between the needs of wildlife and man illustrates one of Nepal's more complex problems, its population growth. The area surrounding the Chitwan National Park is the breadbasket of Nepal. But the population is growing faster than the food supply, heralding grave problems for the future of Nepal. Mount Everest, the highest point on Earth, acts like a beacon to travelers who come from around the world to gaze at its broad shoulders. What once required 12 days of walking from Kathmandu to Lukla can now be flown in less than an hour. Landing is an adventure all its own. The planes unload mountaineers and trekkers who have come to explore Sagarmata National Park. Sagarmata is the Nepali word for Mount Everest. And many of the Sherpa people live inside the park, which was set up to protect not only the scenic beauty of the land, but also the culture of the people that live here. A difficult task, for what began as a trickle of visitors in the 60s today is a flood of thousands each year. And these visitors have had a profound impact not only on the land, but also the people. One popular trek leads up through Namche Bazar, a busy Sherpa village, to the monastery at Tiangboche, and then up to Everest Base Camp.
Nepal is home to eight of the world's 10 highest mountains. Until 1949, they were unapproachable from Nepal. Now they are a mecca for climbers who consider them the most challenging in the world and the most dangerous. One out of 40 Himalayan climbers do not return from their expeditions. Over 50 climbers have died on Mount Everest and many Sherpas die in an effort to get total strangers to the roof of the world. Massive Mount Everest, 29,028 feet above sea level, named after a 19th century British surveyor, is known as Sagamarta to the Nepalese. In 1953, Edmund Hillary of New Zealand and Sherpa Tenzing Norgay of India reached the summit. They were the first. Since then, over 200 people have reached the summit. In what is perhaps the supreme climbing test, Reinhold Messner of Italy in 1980 climbed Mount Everest alone and without bottled oxygen. After climbing Mount Everest, it was the Sherpa people who drew Sir Edmund Hillary back to Nepal. He and many others are attracted by the engaging Sherpas, who traditionally were semi-nomadic. The yak is an essential part of their traditional life, providing them with milk to churn into butter, hair to weave into rugs, and strong backs for heavy loads. At high altitudes, both animals and people carry heavy loads, one of the reasons why the Sherpa men and women have been so successful as porters and guides. Agriculture is an important part of their traditional life. On small plots, they grow buckwheat, vegetables, and potatoes. Another important activity was trade, for the Sherpas prospered importing salt from Tibet into Nepal. After the Chinese took over Tibet, the salt trade dried up. But trekking and mountaineering have been equally profitable. So Namchi Bazaar's Saturday market, called the Hot Bazaar, is still a bustling commercial fair. The Sherpa people immigrated centuries ago from Tibet, bringing with them the Tibetan Buddhist culture. Family elders say prayers from the rooftops to appease the spirits they believe inhabit the rocks, the streams, and the mountains. Appeasing these spirits ensures a healthy, rich, and long life. Generally, the older people are most active in their faith. Spinning their prayer wheels and turning their rosaries while repeating their mantras. Their art reflects their strong beliefs. The Sherpa word for artist is kapa, meaning skilled one. The Tanka style of painting is highly stylized, using traditional technique to depict the Buddhist pantheon of gods, goddesses, and demons. For the Sherpa people of the Kumbu region, one of the most important monasteries has been Tiangboche. Every fall, after the crops are in and before the winter storms begin, Sherpas and increasing numbers of tourists assemble in the courtyard of Tiangboche Monastery to celebrate the Mani Rimdu festival. Great horns are blown, then the monks parade in. Monks play all the musical instruments and all the roles in the three-day celebration. These dancers tell a story out of the distant past, a time when Indian sages arrived in Tibet with the new religion, Buddhism. They encountered an older religion called Bonism, an animistic religion. A tremendous struggle between the two religions ensued, and out of that struggle, a new religion was formed, Tibetan Buddhism.
change is implicit to survival. And although the Sherpas are often seen in a quaint and quiet stability, the winds of change penetrate even these remote valleys. The young people dream of being pilots, not porters. Hydroelectricity powers lights in Namchi Bazaar. But disaster can accompany change. The beautiful Tiangboche Monastery burned down in 1988. A deep and abiding faith is moving the Sherpas to restore the monastery and rekindle their strong cultural base. After centuries of isolation, the Himalayan mountains are revealing their secrets. Shangri-La was a world waiting to be discovered. Western travelers have found the Himalayas. Escaping the age of communication and jets, the traveler steps back into time to a place where centuries-old traditions prevail. Where warm and hospitable people face change with a courage and dignity that sustain cultures rooted in the past but open to the future. For the bold traveler, fresh from exploring the Himalayas, it will be the people, these wonderful, colorful faces, that will be indelibly etched upon a lifelong memory.